do I regret any part of that experience all these years later? You know, it's hard for, uh, yeah, sure, as a writer, you regret how long it takes you to fully figure out what the real situation was. <clears throat> it's hard to find fault, though. I mean, regret really means, what does regret mean? In 2001, Jonathan Franzen first showed the incredible ability that would make him famous and keep him in the public eye for the rest of his life his ability to do precisely the wrong thing at exactly the wrong time. On September 1st, 2001, 10 days before 9-11, he released his third novel, The Corrections. It was a dark, gritty look at the painful realities of family life in America. It was the exact opposite of what the US needed in the wake of 9-11, or so it seemed. Somehow, the divided nation actually took solace in his 600-page epic. They used it as an escape from the uncertainty of daily life. It sold nearly 2 million copies. It won a National Book Award. It was nominated for a Pulitzer. He defied all odds with the novel's success. But this would be the last time that Jonathan Franzen would ever do anything right. For the next 15 years, Franzen became the author that we all love to hate. Time and time again, he put his foot in his mouth. He called famous critics stupid. He made a joke about adopting an Iraqi war orphan so he could understand young people better. He told the New York Times that he writes in the dark with earplugs, earmuffs, and a blindfold. His drama left the literary sphere and entered the mainstream media. He went on Colbert. He was on CBS News. Um, <laughs> He was like the Kanye West of literature, producing critically acclaimed work alongside disastrous public appearances. Since 2016, Franzen has largely withdrawn from the public eye. His sales numbers have declined and his relevance has dwindled. Much has been written on Franzen's drama. So today, we will not focus on the drama alone. Instead, we're gonna focus on the one remaining artifact from Franzen's time as a culturally relevant figure. This meme that I see posted online that has a joke about buying Franzen novels for guys. And we're gonna answer the question asked by hundreds of thousands on Twitter and Reddit. Who is Jonathan Franzen? And why is he considered a writer for men only? And I wanna note here, this video is gonna use the cultural definition of male that is implied by this meme. So here's how we're gonna do this. Three parts. One, who Franzen is and why he's so famous. Two, coverage on his very public controversies. Three, I'm going to talk through the actual content of his writings and why it's consistently mocked for its maleness online. Then we're going to wrap it up by talking about some more meta aspects of Franzen's personality that I think really drive home this image of him as a writer for men. All right, let's start with who Franzen is and why he's so famous. In terms of who he is, Franzen is an author and a cultural voice. He wrote six novels so far, four good ones, two terrible ones, and a couple books of essays on top of that. Now, in terms of why he's famous, I want to start here by acknowledging that there's two types of fame. There's literary fame, and then there's actual cultural mainstream fame. Literary fame is people like W.G. Sebald. I hate to say it, I hope I don't sound ridiculous. I don't know who this man is. Saul Bellow. I mean, he could be walking down the street, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know a thing. You are a career writer of important work. You get to write the occasional op-ed in mainstream publication. Your work gets optioned for TV or movies, but the producers want to bring in a real movie writer for the screenplay. You might win a Nobel, maybe a Pulitzer. Cultural mainstream fame is people like Sally Rooney, David Sedaris. David Sedaris and Amy Sedaris join on an all new 90 minute queen size episode. John Green, Sadie Smith. You don't just get movies and TV shows made based on your work. You get to write them. You get to treat the New Yorker like it's it's a personal blog. You are a borderline celebrity. With just one hit, Franzen became the real, real type of famous. It is a little hard to capture just how culturally relevant Franzen became and how quickly it happened. On August 31st, 2001, no one had heard of him. Two weeks later, when the New Yorker chose nine writers to comment on the impact of 9-11, Franzen was there, sandwiched between John Updike and Dennis Johnson. There have been jokes about him in BoJack Horseman, in Parks and Rec. And the book Freedom by Jonathan Franzen. He got to write two shows based on his books, starring actors like Daniel Craig and Maggie Gyllenhaal. Neither made it to market. He was in the New York Times, The Guardian, The New Yorker, and something called The Huffington Post. He went on Colbert. He went on Jeopardy. It's kind of uh, a nightmare come true for me to be here. Oh God, I should know this. Well, I'm a novelist. Writers who stay confined to novels these days do not get the type of mainstream play that Franzen got. And I want to take a minute to explain why he got this type of play. There's really two main reasons. The first is that Franzen captured lightning in a bottle with the publication timing of the corrections. 9-11 was like some sort of reverse 9-11 for Jonathan Franzen. Every single person in the US was facing the stark reality of an attack on American soil. TV and radio was dedicated exclusively to 9-11 coverage. Movies got put on hold. 
book releases got put on hold. Franzen was able to capture all of the nation's need for entertainment and for distraction and to channel it into his one book. The second reason for Franzen's fame can only really be understood by acknowledging a brutal truth, a stark reality, starker than the one our nation faced on that fateful day in 2001. The reality is this. The Corrections is a very, very good book. It is painful. It is funny. It has thematic depth. It has relatable characters. It had something for everyone, and so everyone read it. And then, of course, once they had read it, they all wanted to know. Who is this Jonathan Franzen? So he was thrust into the public eye. TV appearances, articles, interviews, a full-blown media press tour. And I think that people thought that he would be like his book. Sophisticated, coastal, self-conscious, complex, but oh no no no. The truth that we all quickly learned was that Franzen has a je ne sais pas of stereotypical white guy to him. He is a bumbling midwestern goofball with no filter. He had the ability to say only exactly what he was thinking. He was a drama churning machine. So there is a lot of general Franzen drama that could be covered here. His essays and public appearances made headline after headline after headline for his entire public life. But I want to focus on this idea that Jonathan Franzen is for guys. The origins of this perception are mysterious, unknown even, enigmatic. But through hundreds of thousands of hours of tireless research, I've actually unearthed the origin. The secret reason that people think Franzen is for guys is that he said it directly in one of his first meaningful public appearances. I, I had some hope of actually reaching a male audience. I've heard more than one reader in, in signing lines now in bookstores say, if, if it, if it um, t -t -t today, Junior! If I hadn't heard you, I would have been put off by the fact that it is an Oprah pick. I figure those books are for women, and I would never touch it. Those are male readers speaking. Now, in that clip, you heard him mentioning Oprah, who I think was like the host of a talk show, which I think is like Hot Ones, but without the wings. Oprah had selected the corrections as an Oprah's Book Club pick for September 2001. At the time, this was a very big deal. Franzen would have gone on Oprah's show. He would have had an audience of millions. Instead, he chose to run his mouth to an audience of maybe a few hundred at an appearance at a bookstore in Portland. He said that Oprah had picked some good books, but she's picked enough schmaltzy, one-dimensional ones that I cringe myself. Even though I think she's really smart and she's fighting the good fight, do you think this went over well with the general public? Or incredibly poorly? For these comments, Franzen was famously and publicly uninvited from Oprah's show. As I'm sure you can imagine, the incident was picked up everywhere. It got Franzen a million times more attention than he ever would have gotten from being on Oprah. But that attention was all negative. To the public, this made Franzen look like a huge tool and a possible sexist. In the literary world, these comments gave the impression that Franzen thought that high art literature was for the boys and that beach read book clubs were for chicks. In another incredible display of timing, these impressions came directly at a time in which conversations questioning white male dominance were building in the US. In the microsm of the literary fiction world, this conversation was taking shape in the form of a question. If most fiction readers are, and pretty much have always been women, a YOI are the most reviewed, discussed, and awarded authors male. I wish that I could tell you that the question that I'm phrasing right now was rhetorical, but it wasn't. It was a real question posed directly about Jonathan Franzen in 2010 by author Jody Picoult, who tweeted, NYT raved about Franzen's new book. Is anyone shocked? Would love to see the NYT rave about authors who aren't white male literary darlings. She was then backed up by author Jennifer Weiner. Count the reviews, interviews, profiles, and essays by about writers like then she listed some male writers. Now try to find a woman who's got that kind of attention. NYT loves its literary darlings who tend to be dudes with MFAs. I also wish that I could tell you that Jonathan Franzen understood his place in this conversation and that he respectfully stayed quiet on the whole matter and let the conversation continue without his input. And that's exactly what happened. Psych! Of course he weighed in. Franzen responded in a couple of ways. First, in a Guardian article and a book of essays, he called Wiener a non-literary writer and accused her of manufacturing the drama for self-promotion. Later, he would say directly in an interview that Wiener was freeloading on the legitimate problem of gender bias in the canon and over the years in the major review organs to promote herself. Once again, this conversation blew up. Everyone covered it. The New York Times book review editor, male, was forced to comment on it. He was soon replaced by a woman. An organization called The Vita Count was even founded to track gender bias in the publishing industry. 
And at the center of all of this was Jonathan Franzen. He became a lightning rod for mockery of white male authors. He became blanderized, encapsulated. He became the worst thing that a public figure can become, which is totally understood. He was barred from the introduction of new ideas. For the rest of his career, it didn't matter how self-effacing, how repentant, not very, he was, or how original he tried to be, his persona was locked in. Every publication in the world would clip his essays, his quotes, all of his public appearances into headlines that furthered the narrative that he was this bumbling, stereotypical white guy devoid of empathy or self-awareness. And good lord did he make their job easy. Franzen does not know the meaning of no comment. The more identity-based the conversation, the more irresistible he finds it. It's not even his opinions that make me cringe, though some do, so much as his incredible inability to recognize that he does not need to say them at every opportunity. It's truly ironic that he's so anti-Twitter, because he produces soundbite drama at a rate that would make even the most zanned up Roseanne Barr jealous. So this is the drama that seeded the idea that Franzen was a writer for guys. But this alone was not enough to cement it. So let's move on to Franzen's content as a writer. I'm going to paint a picture here. Those adept in internet culture may recognize this picture before I'm done with it. Color number one in our painting is that Franzen always writes from multiple characters' perspectives, and he always has an equal number of men and women characters. Literally equal every time. I think he thinks this is what equality is, but honestly this concept of equality became dated like, I don't know, probably within the hour of him thinking of it in the 90s. It just does not gel with a modern idea of equality, which is in broad strokes that we don't need more men writing women, we need more women writing women. That's color number one in our painting. Color number two is that relationships are a huge focus for Franzen, so you can imagine that sex comes into play. Since Franzen is a gritty, serious, literary writer, my face looks fat to me. These sex scenes aren't really sexy. What they are is unexpectedly honest. Something must always happen that makes you think, damn, he really went there. Sex do kind of be like that. Color number three in our little painting is that Franzen's prose tends towards descriptiveness. He describes everything, including his characters. Okay, let's take a step back here and look at the painting we just made. It is of a male writer writing descriptive prose about female characters, including sex scenes. As you can imagine, Franzen's prose makes regular appearances on Twitter and subreddits like Men Writing Women, where it is relentlessly mocked for being lame, inaccurate, sexist, lame, and lame. Something else that I think generally gets overlooked about Franzen's writing that makes his readers more likely to be male is not just the characters themselves, but their emotions. When I think of a Franzen novel, the primary driving emotion that comes to my mind is frustration. His characters are frustrated with their lives, with their decisions, with their partners. They feel like they are failing themselves. His characters go to the ends of the earth trying to solve their agita, but they tend to end up exactly where they started. Their frustration is not solved, but the characters gain some perspective that allows them to reframe their frustration or live with it. They essentially let it go. I think that everyone can relate to this, but I think that Franzen captures a particularly male version of it. The frustration is tied to loneliness, to letting down those around you, to an inability to manage your emotions. These are shared problems, of course, but they are typically modern male problems. I do think that this content makes Franzen fans more likely to be guys, furthering the perception that he is a writer for men. Alright, so now you understand why Franzen would be on a gift guide for men. But there's one last thought on the topic that I want to offer. It's what I see as the foundation for this continuing perception of Franzen as for guys. It's the real reason that he'll never shake this perception. So a lot of people have called Franzen a genius for his writing. But if there's anything Franzen did that makes him a genius, it's that he turned off the internet and started focusing on writing only starting in 2002. So most of these things that I've just told you about, Franzen is pretty much barely aware of. But to imagine this man not just dominating literary sales, not just getting a public platform as an intellectual, not just using that platform to drop reactionary opinions on gender issues and make jokes that offend people, but to also be entirely unaware of the trail of carnage and publicity and opinion pieces on your behavior that you are leaving in your wake? Well, that's the most whiskey stone using, beard oil loving, novelty sock wearing, grilling ass thing that I could ever imagine. Okay, this is now the ASMR part of my channel again. Uh, sub to, sub, please sub.